Welcome to the Arlington Street Church podcast. Founded in 1729, Arlington Street continues today as a gathering place for progressive people of faith in the greater Boston area and beyond. We are located at the corner of Arlington and Boylston Streets, across from the Public Garden in Boston, Massachusetts. Please visit ASCBoston.org for more information about this historic Unitarian Universalist congregation. Arlington Street Church, gathered in love and service for justice and peace. So I saw a sign recently. Well, I, okay, I didn't exactly see it. I saw it on Facebook, which is as close to seeing as many of us get these days. Anyway, someone had taken a picture of the sign and posted it on Instagram, and someone else posted it on Facebook, and then a Facebook friend of mine who I probably wouldn't recognize if they showed up at my front door, posted it on their timeline, and it appeared on my computer screen. It's the kind of sign you might see outside a general store or a muffler shop with hand-placed all capital letters, which in this case spelled, humans are 90% water basically cucumbers with anxiety. (laughs) Well, I thought that was pretty funny and and kind of true, so I I posted it on on my timeline, and immediately another Facebook friend, whom I probably wouldn't recognize if they showed up at my front door, posted a comment pointing out that actually the human body is only 60% water. So, of course, I had to Google human body percent water and found out they were right. 60%, give or take. But since we are in the realm of metaphor here, and human beings, whatever our percentage of water, are not literally cucumbers, unless we're using literally in the new unliteral sense, whereby literally means not literally literally, but kind of sort of literally, I'm just saying it because it sounds good kind of literally, in which case, my friends, we are literally cucumbers. But in any event, the exact percentage of water in our bodies isn't as important as the metaphor, which rings true to me. Speaking for myself, I aspire, I aspire to the serenity of a cucumber. With awareness. Awareness carries terrible burdens. Climate change is upon us. And its first victims are the most vulnerable people on the planet, mostly poor and of color. Last year, 2016, was the hottest year in recorded history, breaking the record set in 2015, which broke the record set in 2014. Last July, Dead Horse, Alaska reached 85 degrees Fahrenheit, a new record. Arctic sea ice last summer was reduced to the lowest levels ever recorded. The permafrost, permafrost, is melting, which could release billions of tons more carbon into the warming atmosphere. Also last July, 13 people died in Louisiana in what should have been a 500-year flood. That is, of a magnitude experienced just once every 500 years. Except it was the eighth 500-year flood across the South in the previous 12 months. Last year, the prestigious science journal Nature warned that melting Antarctic ice could raise sea levels more than six feet by the end of this century, twice what was previously predicted with devastating consequences for coastal populations. FYI, Boston is a coastal city. Bill McKibben, who five years ago taught us global warming's terrifying new math, looked at the latest numbers recently and found them even more frightening. To avoid catastrophic climate change, McKibben explained we have to stop all new digging and drilling for fossil fuels 
and building pipelines to move them. Because the mines and oil and gas fields currently in operation worldwide already contain enough carbon to cook the planet. From now on, declared McKibben, anyone proposing a new pipeline, coal mine, or oil well is effectively a climate denier. While we're trying to put out the fire, President Trump is throwing gasoline on it, fast-tracking the Keystone XL and Dakota Access pipelines, and appointing a fossil fuel zealot like Scott Pruitt to obstruct the mission of the very agency he now heads, the EPA. It's no surprise that we've seen Mr. Trump feeling right at home among the oil oligarchs of Saudi Arabia. You know, I still believe our fellow citizens are, by and large, basically good and decent people. We want to do the right thing. We want to help. There are entire professions and institutions whose mission is to help. The Coast Guard. Firefighters, first responders risk their lives. Many would give their lives to save mine or yours. And all of us, if we saw a child whose life was in danger, wouldn't we help? Wouldn't we do something? At least call 911 or maybe do something heroic ourselves. Because if we didn't, the child would die. And yet, how many children will die from climate change and the drought, flooding, storms, famine, displacement, and disease that will follow? And these same good, decent, sometimes heroic Americans don't do anything about it. There are a lot of reasons. Ignorance, ideology, disinformation, helplessness, overwhelm, despair, economic insecurity, addiction to the conveniences and distractions of hypercapitalism. In the throes of addiction, not one of us thinks clearly. It's as if when we call for help to save the life of a child, the people who hear us are intoxicated, so out of it they can't think, let alone act. If we wait for them to hit bottom, that bottom will be a mass grave. Somehow, we have to break the trance and call our neighbors and ourselves into consciousness. The climate crisis is solvable. Solutions are all around us. Wind, solar, conservation, efficiency, smart growth, smart infrastructure, bioagriculture, eco-restoration. It's no longer enough to shrink our personal carbon footprint or to green our congregation. These are good things to do. But many of us have been doing them for decades, and the earth has only grown hotter. We must take our prayers for creation into the streets, into the voting booth, into the corridors of power. Personal transformation, community transformation, institutional transformation and political transformation go hand in hand. None can succeed without the rest. Last September, I was arrested a second time in civil disobedience protesting the fracked gas pipeline then under construction in West Roxbury, where residents are worried about potential leaks and explosions, as well as about the pipeline's contribution to global warming. 
in solidarity with the Standing Rock Sioux in their struggle against the Dakota Access Pipeline, 10 of us blocked construction in West Roxbury by either sitting on the edge of the trench or climbing down into it. The workers kept their distance. But firefighters and police officers, of course, came close enough to remove and then arrest us. We thanked them for their work. One of them replied softly, thank you for your service. They live there too. They don't want the pipeline either. Before the action, 70 of us gathered for interfaith worship at Theodore Parker Church in West Roxbury. We shared our grief for the earth and all those suffering upon it. We prayed and we sang. Singer-songwriter Brian Kale performed his song, Praise Be the Ragtime Band. Praise be the ragtime band. Praise be the rambler's thumb. Praise be the mislaid plans. Praise be the flood if it comes. Praise be the ragtime band. Praise be our mislaid plans. My eyes are dry and they are open. I keep my grief in my hands. Praise be the flood if it comes. How do we praise the flood? How do we praise the flood that wreaks destruction, drowns our neighbors, and sweeps away everything in its path. What if the flood is the breaking of the waters in the birth of a new world? What if the cries of creation are the labor pains of the birth of a new creation? a new society, a new way of being with each other and with ourselves, a way of compassion, a way of kindness, a way of justice, a way of healing. What if the election of Donald Trump is an organ failure in the necessary death of systems, assumptions, norms, beliefs, traditions, aversions, addictions that no longer serve us, if they ever did, that do not serve life on this planet. Valerie Kaur is an Indian American, a Sikh, a civil rights lawyer, and a mother. What if, she asks, what if this darkness is not the darkness of the tomb, but the darkness of the womb? What if our America is not dead, but a country still waiting to be born? What if this is our great contraction before we birth a new future? Remember, Cora tells us, remember the wisdom of the midwife. Breathe, she says. Breathe. Then push. As climate champion Tim DeChristopher reminds us, our old model of trying to meet all of our emotional needs with consumer goods hasn't worked. It hasn't made us happy anyway. Maybe greed and competition weren't the best values to be basing our society upon. Activist filmmaker Josh Fox adds, the values we will need to survive are deep inside of us, waiting to come out. Courage, resilience, innovation, art, creativity, culture, generosity, community, human rights, democracy, the love of our fellow human beings, those are the things climate can't change. And those are the things we do together.
The morning after Donald Trump was elected, Methodist pastor Steve Garnis Holmes wrote, When the temple falls, we are awakened from the illusion that the world is just fine. We finally know what others have known all along. We are vulnerable. We are exposed to the cynicism, violence, greed, and hatred of the world. From the Roman Empire to the Holocaust, to today's unarmed young black men, or the people of Aleppo, or refugees, or the trafficked and exploited, they know. They know there is no guarantee of justice, no illusion that everything will be all right. The whole world is at risk. There is no refuge. There never has been. When the temple falls, Garnus Holmes asks, what do we do? When we can't look to our power structures, what do we do? We become the temple ourselves. When the temple falls, we become the resurrection. We let ourselves be raised, let ourselves be changed. Give voice to your pain and let it rise as courage. Love this world with all you have. Connect with each other. Connect with strangers. Notice beauty. Work for justice. Live what really matters. So I invite you to imagine in your mind's eye a four-year-old child doesn't matter who it is. Maybe it's a girl in the Marshall Islands in the Pacific. Maybe it's a boy in an urban neighborhood in Sudan. Maybe they live here in the United States on the Gulf Coast or Long Island. Maybe, maybe she looks a little like your granddaughter. Maybe he reminds you of your best friend when you were a child. Imagine the shy smile on this child's face. Imagine this child playing with friends. Imagine this child in the tender embrace of parents. Now imagine that it's up to you whether this child suffers, whether this child is in pain, whether this child dies from famine or drought or storm, drowning in a flood that sweeps away her house poisoned by contaminated water, or starving in a refugee camp. Now imagine this same child growing up happy, well-nourished, sustained by family and community, with renewable energy, equal opportunity, and a voice in democratic government. These are the two futures before this child, before us all. Which future becomes real is up to us. Many organizations right here in Massachusetts are doing important work to bring about the transition to the safe, sustainable future. Three of the best are 350 Mass, Mothers Out Front, and Climate Exchange. Information about all three will be available downstairs after worship. And if you want to learn more, I invite you to leave your name and contact information on the sign-up sheets we'll have on clipboards. But is it too late? Is it too late to prevent climate change? Of course it is. The damage has already begun. Some of it may be irreversible. Many will die. Many have died already. But it's never too late to save the next life or the next species. It's never too late to offer love to our neighbor or even to our enemy. Never too late to feed the hungry, to welcome the stranger, to heal the sick, to visit the prisoner. It's never too late to repair the world. It's never too late 
to change. My friends, there is no birth without death. In the Christian tradition, there is no resurrection without crucifixion. Everything is interconnected. All beings are our relations. We are not victims of the flood. We are the flood. We are running waters, says Lakota activist Chase Iron Eyes, seeking a way, cutting fresh courses when spring swells us with power. We move mountains and break banks creating. May we cut fresh courses. May we swell with power. May we move mountains and break banks until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Thank you for listening to this week's podcast. We would love to hear from you via email at office at ASCBoston.org or through our Facebook page. If you would like to support the good work of Arlington Street Church, please consider a contribution by checking the mail or through our website, ASCBoston.org.